Tonics had a great India connection, right? That we could talk about. Uh, also, we're looking at building. a global brand we're already available in hong kong we should be launching in singapore pretty soon so the indian connection with the indian tonic what a bit kind of played out well for us so the idea was that we start with tonics there will be a little more education required but at the same time it's a it's a good differentiator product to start with if i started with a soda i would have had to explain or defend my difference a lot more now that i have some sort of brand recognition it's easier for me to put out a soda Uh, when it comes to education we've done both we've done a lot of b2b education so like alcohol companies we have brand ambassadors their job is to just keep training bartenders and bar staff uh, every account of ours that says swami has gone through a training by us uh, that's the first time in their life they would have gone through a tonic water tasting where most of them don't even know what tonic water actually is or how is it made what is quinine so we've done a lot of that and it's played out a lot uh, it's also given us a lot of uh, dividends because we have very good relationships with a lot of restaurants and hotels because of that hi everyone you're listening to episode 11 of stars and startups with me varun bhumidi on this episode we catch up with the eclectic and award winning photographer anish pasin of swami drinks a brand of beverages that has been part of the latest wave of indian consumer brands that's catering to a premium audience and offering a variety in a segment that has actually lacks some innovation anish and i chat about coffee his experience building his earlier startup hip cask and then taking that experience to building swami that's now got quite the fan following if you want to get into all things swami and building the brand you can jump directly to minute 30 or after wherever you're listening to this podcast also stay tuned till the end there's a giveaway don't miss it Hey Anish, it's been it's been uh, some time, and uh, of course, the you know I, I read somewhere um, you know Anish is a multi award winning lifestyle photographer. And yeah, that's that's my <laughs> line. <laughs> uh, you know, a man of uh, many interests and tastes. So this this particular. Uh, time and we're recording this during lockdown um it's probably very restrictive for you because you know i i mean your insta really about travel about the fun things you're doing the parties you're up to right um right now insta must be like about throwbacks and things that you want to be doing uh, surprisingly not i think a lot of my instagram has been stuff that i've been making right now and uh, th- Firstly, I think all of us are very privileged, right? We have nothing to really complain about right now. Like most of our complaints are Wi-Fi is slow or alcohol is not available, stuff like that. Uh, I think for me, lockdown, of course, now that we we're, we're all used to this and life's a little more calibrated with the lockdown. I think a lot of my uh, content of what I've been up to has been actually about making more drinks at home. Uh, I was a little surprised that. the collection i had that i somewhere also forgot about like it's coming out for the from the attic and they're all coming out uh they're like their appearances like, like one of my distiller friends uh, michael who was the master distiller at paul john he posted about this japanese whiskey and i was like wait didn't i once buy this and then i found it it was there somewhere which i'd completely forgotten about so i think lockdown's been good in terms of uh, for for me personally i think i've i've, I've started learning a little bit more that somewhere i left off so uh, i've been doing a lot of tastings i've been tasting a lot of coffee actually but very methodically i've been taking down notes i've been going growing uh, very properly so uh, i think it's it's been good that way uh, you try and learn as much as you can during this phase and uh, for me beverages is a lot is a large part of what i like to learn about when when you say uh, you've been doing a lot of things like making and, and what's your latest indulgence what's uh, you know what's got you moving so, so two things one is ice i've been making a lot of ice uh, i put out a whole video on how you should just not use ice trays and make bread ice at home super easy you don't have to invest in any money like uh, zero expense thing you can get into if you like cocktails yeah. i actually tried one of those uh, i followed your video i, I did your uh, little ice you know i i realized like i think you asked to break it into 
pieces. Yeah. Man, that was really hard because it seems like the ice is getting a lot harder because, you know, it's a lot more dense. So yeah. I, I couldn't make it happen. So I need to figure out a better... But if you and, just do, do, uh, don't, don't, don't make the ice too thick. Just make a, uh, use a thinner, uh, like height, keep the height a little shallow. Lower. Yeah. yeah. That, that's so what my, my wife recommended uh, as well. Because yeah. you know, I'm like, oh, I need a big piece of ice. So I was going at like, you know, making big one. Three in the morning, taking out the knives and hammers and doing all of that. So uh, that was good. And the other interest that really has come back to me uh, was coffee. And uh, me and Saad, who's one of my co-founders at Swami, we, we've been into coffee for a very long time. But I think, uh, and this one, this is one advice to anyone I would have during lockdown. It's a very good time to learn about coffee and get into coffee. Again, super affordable. It's not a thing that you have to spend too much money on. The only piece of equipment you really need to buy is a 500 rupee original Hario pour over available on Amazon. That's about it. But there are so many roasters right now uh, and it's crazy. And even drinking coffee is super affordable, right? A a 300 rupee pack is going to last you like some 15, 20 uh, cups of coffee at least. So I think... It's, it's a great time to get into coffee. And I think for me personally in life, coffee has really made a lot of other things possible. Like I think coffee is where a lot of my palate got developed, which took me to better whiskey, took me to wine, took me to ultimately hip cask and swami. So I Wait, think wait coffee is, Yeah, coffee is. It, and it's amazing, of, it's amazing how affordable it is. And the, the amount of, like back in the day, we only had Blue Tokai. And I love Blue Tokai. And I've been a, a customer of Blue Tokai. And I've known Max since the very beginnings so it's amazing to see them grow but along with them there are so many roasters right now uh, so any any uh, out, gems that you found yeah so I'm, I'm actually putting out a video about this soon a lot of these coffees are in uh, transit sorry let me shut this. Uh, is this the so, one um, I, I saw i saw an insta uh, sponsored post about somebody aging coffee in a, a barrel a cask Oh, uh, so Koinonia, Koinonia in Bombay and mm-hmm. Dope uh, both do a barrel aged coffee. Uh, then there's a new roastery in Bombay called Subco. Their stuff is really good. But I discovered a few more people and all of those beans are in transit. Uh, so, so there's one coffee plantation uh, type called Geisha, which is usually very sought after. And there's one estate in India doing a Geisha. So there's a roaster from Chennai who supplies that. I've ordered that. The is Geisha Bindu. the type of coffee? Is that, yeah. or it's is that the plantation? It's a, it's a plantation. Okay. Uh, it, the, the plant is called Geisha. So there's Beachwood Roasters from Chennai who's doing Geisha. That's in transit. And there's a roaster from Delhi called Seva Works. They do a different fermentation called anaerobic fermentation. So hmm. it's crazy. Like usually to get this sort of variety, you would be at a really cool coffee shop in a San Francisco or somewhere else. Yeah. And it's amazing of how affordable these things in India are. The same quality or the same coffee in, the, in America, you'll be buying it for double, triple the price. It, uh, you've also, I've also seen a lot of uh, coffees being fermented differently. Like, I think that's, yeah. a, that's a new-ish trend um, yeah. because it, you, know, you typically have just three or four types of or fermentation that happened. I, I think a lot of people listening to this probably even didn't know that coffee is fermented before it is roasted and ground. Yeah, please, please don't drink instant coffee. And uh, a lot brew, of people get surprised. Like, brew for the way. Yeah. Uh, the coffee that we get is actually not, it's literally the seed, it's a pit, right, of the, of the cherry. So, um, and India produces a lot of good coffee. It's just that for the longest time, more of, most of it was exported and now some of it is available to us. But yeah, it is such an affordable, cool hobby to get into, which does change your palate in a, it, for, for the better. I, I also found another um, roaster who is offering uh, conscious coffee. Um, so they they work with certain farms that are not as large as some of the other plantations, but they grow it in certain okay. uh, areas. Um, it, it's called um, yeah, I, I'll have to find the name, but it's called uh, Baza. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, Baza does that. Uh, ba- so I still not bought Baza. That's on my list. Uh, there's a brand called Araku. They also work yep. with a lot of 
like they worked on those sort of initiatives so the gentleman from aruku uh, <laughs> there was this gentleman who got so I, i don't know if you remember this but uh, prior to working at citrus i had a coffee marketplace um, i'm not sure if i ever shared that with you so the gentleman was in touch with me at that time and uh, he sent me literally uh, shit with coffee beans like uh, so it's a civet cat uh, droppings oh. so i still have those boxes <laughs> like i mean so i had i think i met matt at some point i'm like matt i have these uh, yeah. you know he's like dude don't don't bring that anywhere close to me i'm not putting that in my roster <laughs> I'm with Matt on this. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, obviously, it, it's made popular by you know Kopi Duwak, um, yeah, Indonesia. Yeah. And, you know, I, hype. That's right. That's right. I mean, it's limited but, edition, but uh, it's cool. Well. But same with Geisha. Geisha happened because of one of these crazy auctions in Panama, and uh, Geisha prices are off the charts from a few estates. But, but overall, I think Geisha at least lives up to the hype. Like when you taste the geisha, like okay, there's some there's something about this. No, this is a great time to be, um, you know, trying new coffees and and learning uh, as well. You know, ultimately now there's just so much more choice, and you yeah. have, but it also poses a problem because you don't know what to pick, especially if you are new to coffee. Yeah. You probably have a more developed palate. You know what you want, maybe what you don't want, how to brew it. You have a machine, equipment. Yeah. all of that and, and you know you've only crossed that barrier um yeah and i was uh, reading about how even wines became popular uh, in the us right because it is always considered to be a premium product yeah. um, you know because you have beer at you know 3 dollars 4 dollars and then it had wine at 20 dollars 25 dollars so yeah. they always had to pick uh, you know like wine was a premium so one of the things that they did at that time was uh, they started giving like none of those you know notes and all of that where people typically wouldn't understand but started talking about it more simplistically and yeah. you know finding uh, more palatable wines like you just said like it's you know it's a gateway drug uh, so yeah. can you find things that you know <laughs> get you to open up saying okay you know this is a good wine i think I what j- uh, you know just a point to that there's i personally believe uh, beeras uh, beera white did that for the beer market 3 years ago 100% absolutely right? agree yeah yeah and i think that's a great example of a beer that kind of went mainstream uh, which is actually restricted to because very few people even ordered a hogarden right yeah. uh, and the full no, okay. price or whatever right expensive, right your uh, hogarden would have never had like i do think hogarden was the first important beer that actually made people think of a beer in a different way because whatever said now corona again same ab and bev brand but corona still a lager right i think hogarden brought that and beera just made it affordable and approachable and the good thing about beera was they never harped on tasting notes or anything right and i do think a lot of times when you do that you automatically in- intimidate so many people like if i talk about coffee and talk about the top notes and the finish and they like come on man like i think somewhere we have to be past that where did all this start adish uh, you know you, you you obviously went on uh, to do hip cask which came from passion but yeah. you you've been doing uh, you know you've been a professional for many years how did all these develop so all of this somewhere i think started back in the day when i used to be a photographer i was shooting for a book on the alcohol industry and because of that i had to travel to a bunch of the wine trees uh, meet a few people in the trade and they would oblige you with like like if you've gone all the way to a sula or someone they'll oblige you with a tasting right and this is back in the day when sula did not have a visitor center and stuff like that so it was a lot to do with that and i clearly remember there was there was this uh, organization called wine society of india uh, they used to run a subscription model oh right right right, right. you could you could pay uh, monthly or you can get a box yeah yeah you get a box every month or every 3 months or something so i'd gone to shoot them and uh, uh, the gentleman was like after the shoot they had a internal session on tasting wines that had gone bad and just to analyze faults in wines and he's like you know we're tasting bad wine do you want to 
joined this. And I was like, wait, why are people sitting and tasting bad wine? And at that time, I don't think I would have even known the difference about good or bad wine as such, right? So I sat in on that session and I think a bunch of those kind of things, tastings with people who knew what they were talking about, that really got me into it as a hobby. And then I would go to all of their uh, tasting sessions. I remember uh, they'd moved uh, their office to Andheri East and we would battle rains and everything and it would be three of us there for a wine tasting session and it was good. I think uh, just tasting with people who were trying to learn and along with people who knew what they were talking about is what really got me into uh, just tasting everything better. And somewhere coffee came along with that. I still remember the first time I bought a pack of uh, Cafe Coffee Day beans and uh, I just put them in water and stirred them thinking it'll dissolve, right? Like instant coffee. So uh, I think that's a common that, that, you know, I think it happens more often than we think. And Cafe Coffee Day was the only place that was selling beans that time. They had a couple of, their two, three options in that tin, in the, in, in, in the rectangular tin. Yes, Mysore so, Royale. Uh, yeah, yeah, classic. Mysore Royale and one more. There's some forest or something. And, yeah, Dark yeah. Forest, correct. Dark Forest. Dark forest. It, it was in the tin, it looked nice, you could give it as a gift. Yeah. So I still remember taking a spoon of that, adding it to water and saying, what is happening here? So <laughs> I think just a lot of that, and and this is a common story I've heard from a lot of people who I talk to who are now into coffee, like who remember the old days of this. Uh, and I think uh, around that time, no, actually before that, and I have a very, very distinct memory of having a good coffee for the first time in my life. I was uh, early 20s. I was in, I I'd just got into Venice and outside Venice station was this coffee shop. So I was... My train arrival was at some four in the morning, really obscure hour. I had to wait for transportation order to open up. So I was killing time. And the coffee shop at the station opened up like five o'clock. Got myself a cappuccino and a fresh croissant. And I was like, man, this coffee tastes good. I think that's the first time I ever said, what is this? And then I had two, three coffees. I was buzzed. So I think a lot of these kind of experiences just made you think that, okay, there was something different vastly different about what I just had and just got me a little more curious about that. And I think the moment you get curious about a particular thing it, and it becomes a hobby, there's, then it's just going down the rabbit hole. Hipka started purely because of that, because of Sheila and me drinking obscene amounts of wine because of Wine Society of India. I still remember our conversation. We'd come back from one of the wine industry, uh, one of the Wine Society events. We were pissed drunk. And uh, iPhones were just like, we all had just got iPhones that time. And Sheila was like, dude, I want to make an app. And I was like, I want to make an app. I'm like, what do we make an app about? And then we're like, yeah, we're wine drinkers and there's no information on wine. And that's where the whole hip cast idea stemmed from. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, a lot of these kind of things led to led me to where I am. So it, it's interesting you brought up hip cask uh, in, this, in this conversation. So you have, obviously your palate is kind of expanded um, from the time you put just grounds in, in, in water. Uh, Not only that, uh, or, you know, when that when I was shooting for that book and, and finally that book got, uh, the launch of that book was happening, I was, I was there for the event. And because it was a book on the industry, by the industry, every, every alcohol company had put up their bars, right, at the mm-hmm. dinner. And I remember having like a really expensive single malt and just adding thumbs up to it. And I remember everyone giving me the looks like, what are you doing? So <laughs> I've come from that. That's heresy. <laughs> like how, how do you do that? Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I, I've come from that trying to dissolve beans in water and having really expensive whiskey with thumbs up. <laughs> um, so hip, hip cask was something you started in 2014. Um, yeah. Or prior or was, was it 2014? Oh, I think around 2014. Oh, yeah. Because I remember 2013 when I tried to do an app. Uh, I think there are literally three software developers in the country who could do something. Uh, so Android itself was not popular. Uh, iOS, I'm sure nobody even had uh, iPhones to even think about it. How did... Uh, of course, I mean, there was, there was 
land grab happening in the US. People were creating apps left, right, and center. People wanted to do different things. They started offering different things. Uh, but there wasn't enough users on the platform um, for them to be able to see uh, skyrocketing growth. What was your experience? Because alcohol, I would imagine, is everybody loves you know alcohol. And what was what was Hipcask actually? So I don't know what we were smoking that time to think of launching a wine app for for iOS users in India in Bombay uh, that time. But that's how it all started. Uh, I think that time. So Sheila came from a tech background. I knew zero about tech, and I was like, "Yeah, cool. How difficult will it be? Let's make an app." So we got an iOS developer. We got someone to do backend, and I was like, "Cool, amazing. What are the timelines?" They said three months. I was like, "Cool, everything looks good." And you're nine months in and nothing's ready, right? So I think that time the idea was that we launch app first because we thought a lot of the questions people have about wine would be at a restaurant or at a wine shop. So the information ultimately should be accessible on a phone. That was our rationale to go about an app. And that time also apps were not uh, like websites were not that web optimized. Like half of the things you can perhaps pull off today on a site right or half the apps are web pages inside anyways they're not uh, uh, a lot of them are not really native so that time making an ios app seemed the way for us and i think we were we never even th- thought of android that way i think android was really looked down upon especially at that time uh, because there were no really well rounded devices right and that's right there were there android. were tons of issues with android except they were cheap yeah and and developing for for android was so much of a pain right things were not standardized like it was way easier to develop for ios than android you had to test on various devices all of that stuff was a pain so we launched with and uh, with ios i do think that was the right decision uh, going back what then was course, the app uh, so it was a wine yeah. So the app basically cataloged all wines available in the country and it gave you tasting notes. It told you what to have it with. You could sort by price. So the whole idea eventually was that was twofold. Ultimately, we should be able to influence a purchase decision. And ultimately, we should be able to fulfill the order. So to take it in today's context and I've been getting messages left, right, and center saying, dude, start Hipcast. Alcohol deliveries are allowed. Firstly, alcohol deliveries are only allowed temporary uh, till we're in this situation. There is no law or, or no uh, order that it's a permanent thing. You think it's a stopgap arrangement? 100%. Everyone's made it very clear that this is a temporary arrangement till things are happening. Uh, and people are posting stuff, right? And like I like how I was explaining to you on my comment that it's you still can't pay online. You're still paying COD or with a card machine at your home. That's right. So uh, our idea was that we, 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 which could also be applicable tomorrow if online deliveries actually start. That I can be the layer who can tell you what to buy and where to buy it from. So if I become that discovery layer on top, fulfillment can be by whoever. It can be by Amazon. It can be by Zomato, Swiggy. That's not my concern because I don't want to get into last mile. The whole idea was that with Hipcast, that ultimately we should be the resource people come to when they want to figure out what to buy and where to then buy it from. That was predominantly what we wanted to solve for. So was it demystifying wines to a large extent? It was. So it started with wines. Uh, also, I think wine... Uh, every five years, ten years, you've been hearing, you know what, another five years, wines are going to explode in India, nothing's happened. And I do think the wine industry is completely to blame for it. Uh, And I will piss off a lot of people by saying a lot of these kind of things, but the wine industry got all the subsidies possible. Uh, I do think for what Indian wines are, they're too expensive. They should not be at that price. And whatever said and done, Indian wine is not cool. Indian craft beers are cool. I don't think Indian wines are cool. I think Indian beers are cool. I would gladly flaunt a eight finger ready, which I was having right now. You know, I'll Instagram an hour beer if I'm having it. 
it's not the same emotion with indian wines indian wines as a perception that i've seen around seem like a compromise on most occasions is that the goa brewing company one they have eight finger ready yeah it's like ready is goa brewing company now now it's available in mumbai it is yeah so i think you'll be you'll be happy to take a six pack of a eight finger ready or an arbor to someone's house will you take a 1000 rupee indian wine to someone's house i don't know a 1200 rupee imported wine you would so i think the indian wine what's what's there. been what's been the uh, challenge here i think the quality uh, and the price expectation right indian wines also went through this phase where everyone's like oh i will launch the most expensive wine in india i'll launch i'll up you with that so now you have 1400 rupee indian wines you have you have 3000 rupee indian wines which don't make sense and i remember i remember when you travel in europe um, you know you have the the bottom most rack yeah probably 2 2 euros uh one and a half euros maybe they are giving these away for 3 euros i don't know but uh what i've seen is they have very high quality wine i remember enjoying them um yeah. you know so i didn't have to even think about it twice they may not be the most complex wines right but they will be easy to drink wines you're not going to like a lot of indian wines especially reds out of nasi just taste bad and these are wines at 700 rupees 800 rupees uh so we also thought that wines will become a lot popular that's how we started with wines and moving forward over the years we realized that wine was not going anywhere and i don't think it's gone anywhere either uh overall just the perception of indian wines and i don't think there's anyone to blame apart from the industry but two things one they never did anything about making indian wines a cooler brand overall and the quality is not spoken like the quality is not been there uh, in a overall thing there are still some good indian wines and i do think we do decent whites and uh, sparkling wines but red especially out of nasik most of them are just bad and i remember hip uh, hip cask there are these cards that you were doing yeah. uh, so what is that Uh, the hipcast passports the so passport now, correct so I, i'll tell you how that came about there were several times we ran out of money several times uh, once i sold my imac that time we 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 gone we went through a lot of phases where we were completely out of money so hipcast was one uh, passports was one of those idea that actually said dude what can we do right now to make some money and like what can we do right now and that's how like because we were in such a desperate situation and our backs were completely to the wall uh that's how passports came about and the and as we got more and more into it the whole idea was that we can incentivize people buying in bulk so if you're committing to 10 beers you'll get it at a cheaper price so that was a good way to just get people to bulk order essentially it was that was the concept we also uh, uh, started that for coffee in a small scale but i think also that time the number of cafes you could have onboarded for this were very very few so they, remind me uh, when when you did the bulk purchasing of beer i remember you were also driving footfall uh, traffic yeah, to a lot of these restaurants yeah. so did, did they just give away beers that you could you could capitalize also, on so the discount basically came from the breweries and every brand even swami for that matter you have anp your advertising and promotional budget right so every month you do set aside a certain amount of stock that goes into sampling and marketing and stuff like that so for most brands it came from that so there that sort of a uh, allocation that they would have internally and we actually built quite a bit it was super complex because there was a consumer facing app there was a restaurant pass and then there was a analytics dashboard for the brands right so but as a brand you could see which beer of yours is getting consumed where and of course data was completely uh, anonymous but you could get some sort of analytics that okay uh, this is my ratio of men versus women this is the kind of age group we're looking at so the idea was to also start to get data in this industry which is just not been there the only data 
in the alcohol industry is sales data. That's about it. Where rest are all estimations and guesswork. So we thought at least we'll also get some analytics going in this space. And there could be a lot of practical uses for that. So let's say I, I know that I have 100 kegs expiring of my beer in the next three weeks. You could create an on-the-spot offer and perhaps push that out and try and liquidate that. So there were there were a very large amount of use cases for it, but I think we were way ahead of uh, the time there. We also thought a lot of that it could have worked in markets abroad. Like I think the coffee passport would have worked great. Same concept, you're pre-buying 10 coffees, you'll drink them at whichever cafe, right? And coffee prices are still a lot similar, mostly cafe to cafe. Uh, then some beer prices in restaurants are having different price points. Uh, but yeah, that, and eventually uh, Diageo had gotten in, in touch with us for a possible investment. So like, okay, this sounds good. By that time, we'd also built a bot around it. So we actually did a whole demo for Diageo with a Facebook bot. You could ask, hey, what whiskey can I gift? What Japanese whiskey can I gift under 5,000 rupees? And it would throw something at you. So uh, you never know, maybe if things start to get back online and alcohol, maybe somewhere, some of that tech can come back. You're, you're thinking about uh, putting it back out there? Uh, I think if uh, there is some tech that there's possible acquisition that can happen of the IP at least. So let's see. But for us, it's very clear. We can't restart Hipcast and think last mile and all of that. That's that, <laughs> so you you shot that that down right away. Um, it makes no sense when there's Amazon, Zomato, Swiggy. Why will you want to get into last mile? When you look at uh, Hipcask and what it could do, uh, was was there something in the back of your mind talking about gin and you know uh, now the tonic business? How did uh, tonic sound come about? Because I imagine, so, yeah. Uh, I would imagine tonic is still quite niche uh, in a country like India. So, so, so I'll come to that. Yeah. Uh, because after Hipcast, one thing I've learned is I don't want to build a niche product anymore. So uh, Wait, you really have to unpack that for me. Yeah, yeah, I am. So till the time Hipcast was there, I think gins were still not in any time. So craft spirits, there was only Amrut and Paul John. Uh, there was really nothing else even on the horizon. So we thought that a lot of Hipcast's uh, community and sales and all will be beer oriented. And if retail opened up, then it would be open to all sorts of things available in retail. Uh, there, there came a point that we had to wind down Hipcast. There's, we couldn't have sustained that anymore. And uh, that's around the time uh, the whole idea of Swami was brewing. So my brother-in-law, uh, He's the one who started uh, all the work on it. And then I joined him and I got talking to Rahul. Rahul's a very close friend of mine. Uh, Rahul started Gateway Brewing Company with two other partners. So they were the first brewery in Maharashtra to supply kegs and not to open a tap room. So everyone that time was opening tap rooms, right? Dulali, everyone else. And right. Gateway was like, you're not doing a tap room, we supply to other places. So I, ironically, I was drinking... Uh, beer with Rahul at Dulali and just brainstorming and saying, you know what, Sive and I are thinking on these lines and he's like, dude, I want to be in on this. So the whole idea was that we'll create a beverage company. We won't create a tonic company. Tonic waters were the, were the beginning. So we now have four or five tonics. We have a ginger ale, soda is also out. We have a lemonade coming out and then we have a whole range of ready to drink products coming out. And those are all aim that retail. Uh, so Swami will have two very distinct portfolios. One is more for mixers. So th those are consumed with alcohol. The entire other range is ready to drink. So there we're going to rival everything from a packet juice to a Coca-Cola. And I think that for us is a pretty large game to uh, play. So there is no niche uh, play here at all. We're looking at entering tier two cities. We have a massive plan on going into a bunch of those kind of cities this year. You're still targeting a more niche segment, or is it premium? So let me let me not call it niche. Oh, it's premium. It's premium. Uh, I think a great way to define this is we're looking at the beta audience. We're looking at millennials and people who know that they they'll spend a little bit more, like how you would, you would spend a little 
bit more about uh, Kingfisher for a Bira. We're looking at the same customer that you'll spend a little bit more about a Coke or a Schweppes or something to get our product. So for example, we have something in the cola segment coming out. But those kind of products have not, they've not seen much uh, in India. So we're looking at a pretty exciting range of ready to drink products. So one segment is our audience that we're targeting is going to be people who don't drink alcohol at all. Because if you don't drink alcohol, what are your options? If you're socializing or in the evening or a Sunday afternoon, right? Again, package juice or a, or a Coke, Fanta, Limca types, right? That's pretty much it. So we think there's a lot of scope in that sort of a category. And people like me who drink alcohol, but sometimes, again, if I don't want to drink alcohol right now, what do I drink? Uh, there's nothing exciting really, right? So we, we want to have enough options in that category. Historically, this segment, be it tonic water, be it any uh, pairings to um, you know mixers, which you started with, has been played by the bees, right? Uh, you know Schweppes. Uh, I think Schweppes yeah. is part of Coke, is it? Uh, yeah, Schweppes is Coke. Schweppes Coke. There's a bunch of players, including Pepsi. They're the ones who pretty much rule this segment. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we all know that they're going after mass market. They don't want to change anything for a niche market. Their advantage comes in at scale. Um, how did you guys think about that? Because what's your common thread with all these products? There has to be, of course, they're premium, better ingredients, I'm, I'm guessing. So I, we do think a lot of people want to premiumize. Again, I'm, I don't want to be double the price or triple the price. We very consciously want to be at a 15, 20% higher price point. Uh, and two years down the line, if we think we still need a more competitive price product, we'll also look at that. So we, we, some things we already have figured out, some things we'll see how the response is and whether we need to make some tweaks. Uh, but yeah, the whole, the whole idea is that what is the step above? Right now, there's nothing. Like I'm a Diet Coke drinker, not from a calorie point of view, but just a taste point of view. But for me, there's nothing else I can just pick out of the fridge and drink. What else can I have? And I think there's a pretty large audience that can spend 15 rupees more uh, if they have another option. Plus, these kind of products I would want at an airport. It should be at a cinema hall. There are now we don't know when all of that will start, but those are also scenarios we looked at, right? Uh, what do I get at a cinema hall again? It's just four or five beverages in a Red Bull, right? That's about it. When you look at this audience and, and their demands, um, I would imagine there is a lot of education that also goes along with it because it you know becomes that uh, tonic everybody I, from when I remember when you launched I, you know I was super excited because um, I tried some of these beverages abroad and you know I, and I learned the history of uh, quinine and, and the utilization etc it's a great starter in a way because right? it has a story and it has a very yeah. Indian uh, kind of story um, does that education did that education take some time? Because, you know, I would imagine since 20, uh, so, know, 16, 17. So for, so for tonic, that that was required. Also, we started with tonics for a particular reason. Gins were just becoming a thing. Like the gin wave was just hitting India. Uh, it's it, I really find it funny that people collect gin as much as it works for me. So great, please collect gins. I find it a little funny beyond a point. But uh, I think... Tonics had a great India connection, right? That we could talk about. Uh, also, we're looking at building a global brand. We're already available in Hong Kong. We should be launching in Singapore pretty soon. So the Indian connection with the Indian tonic water bit kind of played out well for us. So the idea was that we start with tonics. There will be a little more education required, but at the same time, it's a, it's a good differentiator product to start with. If I started with a soda, I would have had to explain or defend my difference a lot more. Now that I have some sort of brand recognition, it's easier for me to put out a soda. Uh, when it comes to education, we've done both. We've done a lot of B2B education. So like alcohol companies, we have brand ambassadors. Their job is to just keep training bartenders and bar staff. Uh, 
every account of ours that serves Swami has gone through a training by us. Uh, that's the first time in their life they would have gone through a tonic water tasting where most of them don't even know what tonic water actually is or how is it made, what is quinine. So we've done a lot of that and it's played out a lot. Uh, it's also given us a lot of uh, dividends because we have very good relationships with a lot of restaurants and hotels because of that. So uh, that was required. A lot of the products going forward, we don't see that happen, especially in the RT, uh, RTD line. Uh, we know that some products out of that are super self-explanatory and super mass. Uh, actually, I can go ahead and say it. One of them is a pink color product. So we know that certain things can be super mass. At the same time, that portfolio also has one product that I know is going to be super niche. But that product is going to be a cool product that we know certain people will talk about. But my revenue driving products are going to be a lot more massier. So we are we're diversifying the portfolio in that way. Any reason you took the bar route, like the pairings, the mixers, etc.? Yeah, because uh, for a product like ours, and to give you uh, uh, Bera's example, Bera was the brand was built at restaurants. It wasn't built in retail. Uh, most likely, the first time you would have had Bera would have been at a bar. So I think a lot of discovery for products like ours happen at restaurants. Uh, Touchwood, in most places that you would go to uh, a, a good bar, uh, you would see Swami on someone's table or the other. So I think that again and again, you know, just seeing that, seeing it on the menu, seeing some promotion happen with it, I think that 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 drives a certain amount of confidence uh, in the product. And then when you see the same product at the nature's basket, you're more, more likely to buy it than seeing a completely new product out of nowhere. Is that the best way to scale though? Because I would imagine even bars, like it's, it's account by account, uh, you know, there are a few bars that probably have uh, chains, but I, I don't know too many large chains. No. So again, for tonics and soda, another example, they're very, uh, they're good products for B2B. Uh, for example, the RTD line, I don't see that as a restaurant product. So these products do really well at restaurants. And uh, we already, I think six months back itself, our restaurant touch points became more than our restaurant touch points. So overall, of course, we are a FMCG company and more revenues will come from uh, retail. At the same time, I think being at a lot of restaurants makes a difference. You're, you you I do think still a lot of people try us for the first time at a restaurant and then go and buy us in retail. That's super exciting because I've never heard this story before. Did you and, and your co-founders, did you guys have this vision to start with? You're like, okay, let's start here and then we'll get it here. Or was the start like saying, hey, we're just going to go after tonic water uh, and then we'll the see start, what's up. I think the start was that let's First, put the product out. Let's see what the response to that is. And then we'll take the next steps. So when we launched the tonics, it was literally five of us uh, working, doing everything. And when we saw that, okay, you know what? People are excited about this and people do want it. That's when we went and raised the little angel round, redid our packaging properly, did a custom bottle, hired proper teams. That's when we actually had a proper business plan going ahead. But the whole idea first was let's dip our toes and see uh, how the reaction and what the market looks like. I have to give it to you. I, I love the bottle. It's it's Thank unique. Uh, it's really well done. I, I, I've always known you to have an eye for design and, and you know, given. Yeah. So, so when we started, we, we, of course, could not afford to have a custom bottle. That's another pain in the ass to do right from design to final production. Uh, and one thing that's really... Uh, like coming from a space where I would write about alcohol or critique alcohol in a way, I think I have mad respect for even red wines from Nasik. I still do have respect for them because putting out a product on a shelf is a lot of work. Uh, the amount of stuff that goes behind it is absolutely crazy. So it's uh, creating the new bottle was amazing amounts of fun, a little stressful also, super expensive. But yeah, that plays out because 
our original bottle that was off the shelf bottle uh, when we took it abroad just to get some feedback everyone unanimously 99% to our face were like dude your packaging is shit like they would just say it to us they like we love the liquid but packaging is shit this cannot work and now that we take our bottles abroad and we get compliments it's such a good feeling to have a completely opposite reaction to what we've seen earlier baby steps right now uh, you yeah. got to live through that when your bartenders were being shown this product uh, they've never used it before uh, they probably still opening the cans of schweppes and kind of you know uh, chugging and like saying oh this is the best stuff ever right but it has zero quinine right uh, or maybe maybe a trace amount of quinine saying how oh, that is quinine in it um how did they react to it what was so what is the pushback did they, was there any pushback there was pushback on certain things so when we launched uh, we only launched with low in sugar tonic so our sugar was half the amount of schweppes now that worked well for some markets but for example in delhi there was a big pushback because they're like yeah, they like we don't like this this doesn't taste good to us it's bitter and and yeah and nothing i can't take offense to that because your benchmark is only been schweppes right so we launched what we call the original tonic water that is slightly sweeter still not as sweet as schweppes but around the same ballpark and we increased our carbonation and that has helped us a lot with a lot more markets and fair enough like this is not a moral argument that this is how something should be had ultimately it's your money uh, you buy what you prefer and we 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 created a product for that and there are use cases for it a lot of times i also use the product because if it is a heavier gin or i just want to add less tonic i don't want to add the full tonic there there is use for it and that's what we did the way you launched uh swami also is quite novel you use a lot of content you use a lot of properties you built actually some ip around the brand as well can you take our audience through some of that uh so one thing we've done is that we've done a lot of events because i think for us sampling and this will become even bigger with the ready to drink product range sampling is super important uh that's also a great learning from red bull red bull is killed it with sampling Uh, so amazingly well done right simple stuff you have people with red bull bull backpacks handing out red bull as simple as that do you have swami girls handing out swami no no we have we we, we are gender neutral we can have swami boys also but uh, at some at some stage hopefully yes but i think sampling is super important so we've done a lot of events around making sure that happens and a lot of times we so usually in the space a liquor brand dominates an event so if it's and this happened recently it was well, it was a milestone uh, for levis it was the 175th year of the blue denim or something like that so for the for the big levis party it was a swami bar usually it would have been an alcohol driven bar right so swami did the bar and we like we will pick what alcohol we want to serve and the bar was amazing fantastic response no problem in there so i think we are coming from a from a point of view that the tonics and all which are still in the mixer category a mixer brand can can do the bar we are not a second fiddle to a spirit we can also do it because we also are in the position that we understand and a lot of these learnings come from past experience right and we know what will work with what because we've at least i've done content for a decent amount of time now so that has helped us quite a bit and we do a lot of uh, during lockdown we did uh, a super late of cocktail league uh, so that came about as an idea that we know that restaurants are suffering right now what can we do somebody to help out restaurants in whatever little way we can so the idea was that let's create a let's create a ip of uh, whatever we want to call it but ultimately restaurant should be getting a cash payout at the same time it shouldn't look like charity like that's not the sentiment here i'm not doing anyone a favor uh, and no one should feel sheepish about it or anything like that so we came up with what we call what we call the superlative cocktail league 
competition format, completely lockdown, quarantine friendly. Uh, instead of making drinks, you were basically designing the drink. So essentially, you're not physically making the drink, but you're telling us the inspiration behind it, what the what the ingredients are, why are these ingredients, and stuff like that. Uh, and that went went off really well. And not only did we give away uh, eight and a half lakhs of cash awards, uh, the winner also gets to do a limited edition ginger ale with Swami. So a lot of the participants also went through to see how we make products. It actually put them in our, uh, in our shoes. And we told them everything. You guys will have to think about why will someone buy this product? What will be the name? Because your name will impact, right? Am I a product that's being a mixer? Am I being a ready to drink? So they had to, they, and most of them designed really proper pitches with marketing plans with how the label should look like. So it was a really good three, four weeks of very, uh, very, very creative content uh, from a lot of uh, participating bars. And the cool thing for us was we worked alongside bigger liquor companies that we anyways do. So Moy Tennessee uh, Brands, uh, Hogarden, Beefeed, all of them supported the league and made the prizes possible. So I think an IP like this again, We've helped out the industry in a very, very genuine way. And we've also strengthened our relationships with them. And we were very clear with this league also that there's not about a Swami exclusive push or anything. So even if you were a Schweppes exclusive contract restaurant, you could take part. We put this very big explicitly even in our rules, saying that if you have a Schweppes contract, no problem, please take part. So that's what we did during lockdown and it worked well. What's a Schweppes contract? So do they block out others from supplying? Yeah. Holy. That's, that's incredible. And, and technically, I think there's, there's anti-competition law for that. But of course, that doesn't work uh, really here. Uh, but yeah, so basically what Coke and uh, O does this a lot, uh, Naram Beverages, they have a brand called Qua, their water brand, and then O. Ocean their range of products. Uh, not only that, they'll pay you cash. So they'll, they'll be like, okay, we will spend X lakhs on you for sponsoring a DJ, doing this, doing that, and you have to keep our products exclusive, exclusively. So that happens a lot. Narang uh, are the same guys who uh, are the franchise like license owners for Red Bull. They used to be no longer. Yeah, but they got down Red Bull to India. They, I think they're pretty large distributors of, yeah. of stuff. Yeah, uh, they, they got down Red Bull initially. When you go through this process and you're hearing, uh, you have you know years to the ground uh, trying to develop all these different products, right? Uh, for this segment, uh, which you're calling the premium category, how you go about product development? Is it like saying, okay, let's take things that people already understand and, and like, and let's make them better. So I think, uh, so firstly, we're the only company, we're the only premium beverage, whatever that term would be company in Asia that does everything in house. So we don't contract manufacture, we set up the facility ourselves. And we've done all the product development in house. Uh, we've made a lot of mistakes. I think the first home batch I was trying of tonics, I made some error and I put 800 times the quinine that I should have put. Like, I don't think Sile and I could taste anything for two days uh, after we tried that out. So, so, so mosquitoes will not actually get close to you for the I, next hundred years. I, it was great. Uh, like, like two days, there was no, we, we couldn't taste anything. It was just bitter uh, and bitter taste in the mouth. So the way we're going about both the portfolios now, mixers and RTD, is that we need to hedge out the portfolio a little bit. We need to make sure we have products that will be volume drivers. For example, a soda will be a volume driver. In the RTD range, we know at least two out of the four products are super volume drivers, but we know for a fact that one of them is going to be niche. But that product is going to be what people will talk about in your cooler, uh, things and that's a product that we want to enter in competitions abroad and stuff like that. I, I personally love the product and nothing like, but we know that the audience is going to be lesser because for that product, unless you get it, like if you get it, you get it or otherwise you, and it's going to be super polarizing. You'll either be 
you will either be saying like an ipa you will either love it or hate it it's going to be on those lines but there have to be enough products where you where your education is a lot lesser and people can read and immediately figure out what this would be and we're looking at trends right we're trying to see what will work better for someone who doesn't drink what will work better in a amdabad like again moving out of the whole metro this thing because bombay is a bubble bombay works very differently to how most other cities work in the country and we've got to look beyond bombay delhi bangalore those are anyways a key markets right now but what next how do we have deeper penetration are you exploring um when you say you know smaller cities uh, i'm guessing it's just relative because in india cities are quite large so yeah. even if you make uh, a good cola brand you're yeah. probably going to be the third or fourth cola in the market which is great it is still large enough uh, if you do a yeah. good job yeah. and you're not playing playing the price game you're still playing uh, the quality yeah so the, I, I i was hearing i'm forgetting the gentleman's name he uh, heads uh, marketing for unilever based out of singapore uh, he was he said something really interesting he's like a lot of fmcg brands will start off as differentiator on price this that and the moment they have to scale up they'll drop prices they'll change the way they advertise to how a bigger product would have done it so i think for us it's super important to still maintain why are we different and maintain that price point there is no point lowering price points to match coke if we can't like i know i can never match a coke's price because of scale itself right the the raw material cost the packaging cost those guys for them those costs are so little right uh, with the volumes they do so we know we can't fight them on price we rather fight them on quality and that's that's what we are doing well they they have got 95% sugar in any case so Um, yeah yeah when when you're looking at this audience uh you know obviously the taste palettes are different for men and women in india specifically it's, it's very diverse um you know and, and you brought it up saying there's the alcohol drinking population which takes care of a lot of the some segment of the men that go to a bar or you know uh, and i see um, a lot of these breweries also launch ciders uh and other similar products to have some sweetness some uh, new flavors yeah. that that women can try is there a trend in in the uh, you know beverage market as well that that's a little different that women want more there is, uh, there is for example in the uk the trend in the in, in the gin industry has been pink or fruitier gins so hendrix has a pink gin bifida has a pink gin uh, bombay saf has something they call the bramble so everyone's doing fruitier products and again there's nothing wrong with it if there's an audience for it why not we do see that here as well and uh, we've also planned our uh, portfolios uh, accordingly like diet coke versus coke zero uh, from one of the things i was just doing research right and it came down to i don't know how true it is that coke zero for men sounded a lot better than diet coke and like now we are we, now we are starting to think of a lot of these kind of things right like if i say pink in my name will men actually pick it up or not uh, so a lot of these things now we're thinking at a mass level which we perhaps earlier didn't do would that mean that you would actually place these now in stores or there's going to be a different strategy because you don't you don't want to pay the placement fees and there's just a whole lot of other nonsense that happens yeah so 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 it's expensive a lot of listing fees are expensive but ultimately i think building an online brand there's so much noise though right i do think seeing a product in retail again and again drives some sort of confidence at some level i think advertising at retail stores still drives some sort of uh better visibility because i don't think only online can work in india at least and there's i can say anything right i can uh, i can say home grown less sugar handmade crafted organic for that matter like i've seen people throw any term on any product even if it's not applicable so i do think for deeper penetration you have to get into stores 
and that's what we are planning it is more expensive i think that's where also uh, funding or having some that can also help you right you can get a little more aggressive with more retail touch points and i think that's super important uh, i do think for a fmcg business especially like us physical retail will be super important i was going to say uh, because today the flavor season seems to be direct to consumer uh, shipping stuff right to you know your doorstep i see what you're saying uh, when you're looking at uh, placement in stores there is a um, there's a trust and feel to it where you know it drives so, a so my so my own, connection my whole thing is that it should be extremely easy for someone to get it to their home so it should be home delivered in whatever way but it should be everywhere still so for example it and our swiggy stores will be live in most cities now but if i if i look at if i search for swami on swiggy right now the swami store shows up but a lot of the other general stores show up as well so as long as you're at enough of those stores it's fine whether they are delivering to someone or someone's coming to pick it up it's fine also there are better margins with us so it's also a lot of times that the retailer will push us automatically if we are with him does it still happen uh, retail pushing products because today i feel like when you walk to a into a store um, you know back in the day there used to be somebody behind the counter and he'll give you something right to say oh, i want to no, bring yeah we have promoters at stores who will push for our product uh if you pick up the phone and you're ordering he'll say re swaps ki jagah x mami right so he'll push it because there's more incentive for him it works uh, or so right. so you're saying that if you're giving an alternative saying hey why don't you try this um, yeah. you know so it's not like if you just go to the store randomly you say here buy this but you say do yeah, you, know, you have or, this or like you know like if someone's about to order swaps he'll only say swaps na yes swami hai acha bikta hai this that and he'll push it right okay. so i do think a lot of those things make a difference as much as we i would want it to be there it's only running performance marketing and getting stuff going uh, as that will anyways happen but i do think we we are not in i don't think we're in the segment where you can ignore uh, physical retail no but i i like the point you were saying because at that point because somebody you know is already in the market for uh, a tonic um, yeah. you know and, and you and and i think your bottles kind of explain the story and and do all of that in any case so even if they're getting it for the first time and they're trying it at least their experience is um, kind of fulfilled right because they start to end once you get the bottle you get to try it you get to taste it you can choose think, it also comes down to sampling right uh, it's much easier for someone to order one or two bottles from your local kirana guy somewhere then order a pack of 12 or 24 uh in the first go so i don't think you can discount uh, physical retail at all uh, we are still reality check it's still in there uh and it's it, there is, there is a lot of play in that i think i think it's also about segmenting your user and you know yeah. exactly where they are and where they shop you can't do this for any random product. any physical product you're getting into stores and mass production requires a lot of cash uh um, yeah. and and especially competing with the guys you're competing with today how did how do those discussions go down with your angel investors and and now i'm i'm sure you're always fundraising cuz this is a market yeah. where you need to continue to yeah. keep money in the bank yeah so i think so far um uh, and it's not like that it's an option for us but we have to play the startup card right i have to tell the nature's basket that do it i can't i don't have the budgets of a coke right to advertise or do something with you i think the journey for us has been that a lot of the bigger stores that we spoke to completely ignored us in the beginning or they would like raul and i would go to nature's basket's office in vikrodi they would make us wait for 2 hours and then say you know what come later we're busy now and stuff like that over the period of time i think in both of these chains at least we are the market leader in aerated beverages after coke so i think now they talk to us in a much different light and uh, because the product moves they are also open to doing things at a lower cost than what they would have probably done it with a coke or a bigger brand so those things are those things have worked in our favor a little bit but 
we are not looking at holdings or stuff like that right now but we do know that this is a this is a game where you'll have to put in a lot of advertising money and in most fundraise rounds that we do usually half the money is towards advertising and marketing specific because these are this is patient capital right because you're looking at longer term plays uh, yeah. so we, we mostly have professional investors on our cap table so they're all good investors they're all professional investors and then we have a few people who are from the industry so i think everyone understands that this is a it's not a one or a two year game it is a five seven year game but on the other hand there are enough acquisition possibilities in the future right there are so many companies that may want to have the sort of portfolio uh, in uh, pro- products in their portfolio so i think investors also to see that that there are enough acquisition options going forward so that's great i i i see where you're coming from because obviously it's a it's a tougher market to uh, you know raise but uh, i think very few people make uh, go after these segments also so you have very few competition per se because there is a barrier to entry to a large extent uh, so there is a barrier to entry, but on the other hand we have a lot of brands who so we in fact uh, the place that we manufacture we have a agreement that we lease the space out of them but ultimately it's our equipment and our everything uh, they get they get two inquiries a month saying that can you make tonic water for us so i think a lot of people think tonic water is a very big market or a very big game and let's just create tonic water and people will line up to buy it which is of course not as rosy as it seems uh, it's really not so i do think there will be competition there will be a lot of home grown brands that come up but i think a lot of them and not to sound obnoxious about this but i don't think a lot of them will un- will understand how complicated these things get and i think again this the horeca side the re- the restaurant and bar side has worked really really well for us and that's also worked well because we knew that between rahul and i we would have contacts with mostly everyone in the restaurant space so we knew that people will at least do a tasting of our product whether they keep it or not will ultimately come down to the product so i think because of the product doing well and the amount of effort we've put in training restaurants and bars and the kind of initiatives we've done with them for a bar to remove us or to keep another brand they will put some serious thought into it it's not going to be a price uh thing that okay if it's 2 rupees cheaper i'll keep you it's not that and i think a lot of that comes with it's it's taken us work it's not been easy but we've put in that 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 much work for it when you're looking at expansion are you going to look at india first and what would be the penetration you probably want to hit uh, you mentioned you're going to hong kong and i mean rather you've started at hong kong and obviously it's not a great time to gauge if it's a, it's a market <laughs> to do well um uh, how are you looking to an expansion so, so a lot of these markets we know volume wise will not be that much just look at the population right versus india but these are also showcase markets and it gives you some more validation uh so for example panorica in hong kong uh so with monkey 47 beef eater and with millet they've been doing a lot of their promotions with us so the fact that even a beef eater in hong kong is working with us it just gives the brand a lot more credibility uh the same thing happened with uh, paul john and amrut whiskies no one cared about these brands in india till they went abroad won medals and suddenly restaurants wanted them here as well So a lot of these are also showcase markets where you know volumes may not be that crazy as what India would be, but the validation it gives you all round is really really good to have. Like if you went to Singapore and the bar that you went to served Swami to you, you will remember that. As a customer and even within the trade, within the trade everyone sees what everyone else is up to. So it's super important, and we do that. Like when we uh, went to Hong Kong, we did. we've even done guest shifts in hong kong by now uh, if there's a bar show happening abroad we we make sure we are there so there's a lot of emphasis on being seen also in the global space and that also helps both short term and long term for the brand what how do you evaluate a market though is it is in population or you know what would what would constitute to something uh, as a as a showcase market 
uh, showcase market will not be about number of volumes. We know that volumes will be lesser. But what happens is that we are playing against Fever Tree and every other brand, right? And we're playing at the same price. In India, it still will have a price advantage over an imported brand, right? That I'm cheaper, so perhaps people will keep me for that. In a Hong Kong, we have zero advantage uh, of anything. We're, at, we're exactly at the same level, level playing field as any other brand. And in that, we would be the smallest company. A Fever Tree, all of these guys would have way more money than us. Uh, Fever Tree is at some $3, $4 billion market cap right now. So to, to get acceptance there and for someone to pick us versus 10 other brands in these markets, I think that's just important for us. We know volume-wise, they'll be, they'll be smaller than a Bangalore or something for me, for sure. But it's good to be there because... In the B2B circles, in the restaurant and bar industry, everyone sees what a lot of these bars are up to. And uh, it also gives you better content that you can push around and stuff like that. I also think from a future fundraise point of view, it helps, right? That uh, you do have validation abroad, so at least the product is solid. Yeah, Nish, this has been fun. Uh, we've covered a lot of different ground. From this discussion, there are two takeaways, takeaways for me. Uh, both good ideas came from alcohol. And yeah, 100%. <laughs> so, Absolutely. so go grab your friend, go have a drink. Uh, yeah. There's probably going to be a thousand other ideas that come to life uh, to do that. Yeah, plus uh, one more learning is that I think definitely think a lot more scale with somewhere at Hipka's Queen uh, initial days we didn't, then of course we played out a lot more scenarios, but I do think scale is super important and we're lucky to be in a country where at least we have the population to do something at scale. Uh, if you were a business out of Hong Kong or Singapore or something, your scale would also be super limited. At least for us, we have that on our side. Uh, uh, is the audience yeah. going to get uh, free uh, Swami for the lifetime? Yeah. You know, we, we, can, we can do a discount code though. Okay, let's do a discount code. I leave uh, Swami discount code wherever you find this podcast. Yeah, hey, Anish, thanks again. Good luck with, uh, you know, whatever is about to come. Um, you know, I'll see you soon for that beer. Cheers, man. Hey guys, that brings us to the end of the episode with Anish. Anish has graciously offered a 15% discount on orders or placed on swamidrinks.com. That's S-V-A-M-I-D-R-I-N-K-S.com. Um, the coupon code is STARS, S-T-A-R-S. The coupon should be active for about a month. So till the end of June, the coupon code should be active. So go, go on, try out Swami drinks if you haven't already tried it. The tonic water is fantastic and I know a lot of people who like the ginger ale. So those are my recommendations. So go check it out. Um, do follow the channel wherever you're listening to this podcast and uh, please, please do sign up the newsletter if you already haven't done so, so that you can receive the podcast delivered directly to your inbox. Also, do me a favor. If you're on Apple, uh, go and give us a five-star rating so that others can find us too. Okay, see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.